please don't be that artist that be spamming people with links to their music and, and people's DMs, man. I don't know one person who that type of promotion works on. That's like literally one of the quickest ways for someone to get their message request deleted by me. Like you sending me some unsolicited and lazy copy and paste message begging me to stream your song with like five fire emojis at the end. Why in the man, why in the world would I ever do that? Like, what would you do if somebody sent you this same exact message? Like, bro, it kills me because artists like that are deleting similar messages that they get from other artists. But then for some reason, they think it's effective to turn around and do that same strategy for themselves. What's good and welcome to Indie Leverage. We're back with episode number four of Let's Talk About It, where we're looking for some of the best advice out there for independent artists. Great music alone won't cut it anymore. We got to get great at things like marketing, branding, content creation, and the list goes on. So let's talk about it. For the first clip I'm going to pull up, Jesse Cannon from MuseFormation tells us how musicians make their POV videos go viral. POV TikToks are really driving songs into the TikTok algorithm lately, but there's a trick to make them really effective. As I've told you, the best way to get people to stream your songs is to tell them the emotion they would feel if they listened to your song. So if it's an EDM banger, make a POV showing the club getting wild. If it's a sad ballad, show someone bawling their eyes out. You can make numerous POV videos for the hook of your song, reiterating the emotions that will make the audience feel if they hit play on it, and it will get them to jump to Spotify or YouTube and stream the song Song to hear the full thing if you show them an emotion that they'd rather feel all right man so that was jesse's take on pov tiktoks and we've talked a lot about creating a visual representation of the emotion that your song makes a listener feel and using pov style tiktoks is a great way to instantly show somebody what your music would do for them and just like any other business you got to think of what the customer or the consumer once first you know how would somebody who's completely brand new and who's never heard of me or my music react to this piece of content that's the question that i try asking myself before i post anything and matter of fact before i even start creating anything that's something that i try to start asking myself and there's so many different ways um to figure out the emotion that your song can make somebody feel and i feel like even though we could be pretty good at judging our own music, we also might be naturally a bit biased about it as well. I mean, obviously being the ones who create the music, you automatically have a different perspective from everybody else. Now, of course, that's a good thing, but I feel like it also could potentially be limiting. It might be better to also get the perspective from a few other people. It's kind of like how an artist can write and record a song. And let's say it's not just any song, like it's, it's a hit song. It's reached a good amount of people and it successfully became a part of culture right now that same song can be interpreted in virtually an endless amount of different ways depending on what the listener is personally going through at that moment and this may alter or even determine the way that they interpret the song and i mean music can basically be traced back to as far back as you could trace people and it's been historically used to help us deal with whatever it is we're dealing with and not only is it an expression of whatever the artist is going through when they create the music but i would argue you know that it's also an expression of whatever the listener is going through when they listen to it as well but regardless of whether or not it contradicts the original meaning that the artist meant for it to have and then tying that back into pov videos that's when you can really start to explore the different types of content that you serve to people. You feel me? Like you become pretty limited if you're only marketing or promoting your music from a place that comes from only your perspective. And if you step outside of your own shoes, you can try to start conceptualizing how other people might be interpreting your music. And we can even do an example. Let's say... uh. 
let's say you have a song where you're talking about losing the love of your life. So it's a sad song about one of the biggest heartbreaks you ever had. And although your perspective of the song is that it makes you feel sad and it makes you want to mourn a lost love or whatever, that's not necessarily what a listener is going to be thinking or connecting to if and when they do connect to your song. From one of your listeners' perspective, they may be going through something completely different than in your scenario, but they still find a way to correlate the two things. But let's say... um, Let's say for this listener, while they were feeling the emotion of lost love, instead of seeing it in some like romantic type of way, they may have a parent that passed away when they were a child. And these are two completely different examples of how someone could be mourning a lost love in their life. And the feeling and the emotion can be similar, but the situation can look completely different. So I feel like incorporating these POV videos would be a great way to connect with people. But I'd also encourage you to take it even a step further. You feel me? Like rather than just thinking about what emotions your song makes somebody feel, you know, use that answer. And then once you've been able to pinpoint the different emotions that your song brings out of people, then you'll be able to think of the different scenarios where this emotion can be applied. You can also ask other people what type of emotions that they get from hearing your song. But the problem is sometimes I feel like people will find it difficult to be able to articulate the um, the emotions that they're feeling. A lot of times it'll be years later that I find myself personally looking back at a song that I connected with. And it's only after all that time that I'm really able to put together how it may have been helping me through a particular problem or a particular phase in my life. So when you put someone on the spot and you ask them what type of emotion that your song makes them feel or what specific memory it makes them think of, they're likely to give you some, you know, shallow response. Not intentionally, but, you know, if if you had a sad song, they'll probably just say, well, it gives me a sad vibe, bro, you know. <laughs> or if you made a, a song that, uh, that was meant for the club, they'll probably say something like, oh, it makes me get lit, man. It makes me feel like I'm about to go to the club or something like that. So, like I said, sometimes I feel like things need to uh, marinate just a little bit in order for somebody to truly understand why they connect with something and that's not just music that could be any form of entertainment or even things like food or people really because like it might be years later and you think back on one of your exes and you can never see yourself with them now but after some time has passed it all starts to come together where you're like oh this is why i was attracted to that type of person and that's why i avoid these type of people to this day and remember, hindsight is always going to be 2020. So I feel like it's our jobs as the artists to get creative with it. You feel me? So it's not just marketing, it's creative marketing. And I'm personally going to start doing this with my own music promotion. I set aside an hour or two every song that I'm pushing. And I'm going to just use the time to get creative and to think of as many possible scenarios and situations that a person could connect with my song. And I feel like that'll be a way to create multiple POV videos for the same song without feeling like, you know, I'm stuck in a box or something. And regardless of what type of content is being created, I feel like this type of mindset is a good practice. Like it's a good mindset to have because I think it's important to think multidimensionally when marketing, like no matter what type of marketing that you're doing, but especially with music marketing, because of how subjective music naturally is. This whole music artist journey can be pretty lonely sometimes. You know, you already chasing something that most people won't understand. You got people that say they wanna be music artists, but then you go to talk to them about business or marketing or shit strategy in general, and then they got nothing. Their whole idea of networking with other artists is sending out links and basically panhandling for likes, comments, and plays on their music. And it wasn't until I went all in and I got the coaching, I watched the videos, I joined the master classes, I took the courses, I went all in. 
It wasn't until then that I realized how much time I was really wasting with these people who is never gonna take this as seriously as I do. So if you a true musicpreneur, then I'd like to offer you a lifeline and invite you to a one-on-one -on -one session with me that we'll treat like your own personal mastermind, where I'll answer any questions and we can strategize actionable steps tailored to your unique situation. I'm only opening up a limited number of slots each month, so if you'd like to apply, you can visit www.indieleverage.com slash live call. And don't worry, I put the link down in the description for you. So for now, let's get back to the video. But anyways, man, shout out to Jesse Cannon one more time for that, that first clip. In this next video, we got Ditto Music saying that we should stay independent and they even break down what it really means to get a record deal. That's why we want to sign you. We're a major label and you've gained our attention by building an audience, creating a lot of buzz, and even one of your songs has gone viral. Oh wow, this is the moment that every musician dreams of. A major label wants to sign me? How much are you offering? Two million dollars. Two million dollars? I can't even conceptualize having that much money at once. Well, you won't be getting all of that money up front at once. You'll be getting paid out over time for every album you complete after you complete it. How many albums will I have to complete in my contract? Six. Six albums, that's a lot, but one album every two years, that comes out to be about a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a year, plus album sales and streaming money, that's a livable wage. Well, you won't be getting any money from album sales or streams. What? Yeah, we will own the masters to your music, and that two million dollars isn't a salary, it's an advance, so that'll just go into the budget of all your records and then be considered recoupable funds. So I'll use that money to make the albums and live off of? Correct. And then I'll have to pay it back with album sales? That's correct. So it's kind of just like a loan? Um, yeah, that's correct. But I'm already building my audience, creating buzz, and going viral without a label. See, man, I feel like that's what a lot of artists just don't understand. And that's myself included, to be real. For the longest time, I was under the misconception that all you needed to do was to get the attention of a record label. Or all you had to do was stack up and get some big feature on a song and then somehow you would magically make it. And it's becoming more popularly known that a lot of artists are better off just going independent. And independent can look a whole bunch of different ways, you feel me? It's not necessarily um, just the artists and their distro kit account. Once you get to a certain level, you could start partnering up with or hiring other companies that will help you continue to grow to that next level. And the A&R position has completely changed compared to what it was way back in the day. You know, now they're looking at numbers and they're looking at data and metrics. They want to see some sort of proof of concept before they invest anything into you. But like she was saying in the video, once you've already started to build up your own audience, you have the opportunity to have complete control over that and to monetize your fan base to the best of your ability. And I feel like owning your masters is really a buzzword. You know, people that don't even really know anything about the music industry would tell me things like, just make sure you always own your, your masters, bro. Like, I mean, yeah, of course you want to own your masters, but it's so much deeper than that. And Depending on how your deal is structured, you could be signing away a lot more than just the rights to your music. I mean, not only do you have to recoup the money that was already advanced to you, but some of these deals are structured to where they end up making money off of your entire brand and your likeness. So that, that doesn't just mean merchandise, that means any commercials, anything that uses your image and your likeness. And everybody's situation is going to be different depending on the leverage that they'll have. So whether or not you feel like you want to stay independent or eventually sign to some sort of label, it's always going to be in your best interest either way to build up as much of an audience as you can and to gain as much leverage as possible. Because the more you have to offer, the more power you have during negotiation. And I hear stories all the time on like different podcasts and interviews where an artist pops all the way off. They are having massive success on their own. Maybe they just started going crazy viral on TikTok. But then that's when they get all the meetings with the top record labels. You know, that's it's like blood in the water. So best believe the shark's going to be coming. And I'm not trying to demonize record labels or anything like that. But you hear all the time with these artists um, that they decline the offer that's being given by these major labels. And a lot of the times, 
they'll even disclose that the deals that they were offered weren't, you know, they weren't bad. They weren't necessarily something that would mess them up or, you know, they might even be fair deals. But you hear these artists say almost every time that they didn't accept any of their offers because, you know, they wouldn't be doing anything for them that they weren't already doing for themselves. So it's kind of like how they say you need experience to get a job, but you need a job to get experience. Once you get to a certain point, you're kind of like, well, at this point, I could just do this for myself. But no matter what your long term intentions are, whether you want to sign to a deal or not, the best bet for you is to keep gaining as many fans as you can. Like it's all about establishing a real connection so that you can grow a loyal community. But let's go ahead and switch it up a little bit. This um this next bit of advice is from Ed Sheeran. And he explains why being nice can be one of the best things for you in the music industry. Want to know Ed Sheeran's advice for smaller artists? Here it is. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, have you any advice um, or top tips for any upcoming musicians or any kind of wisdom you'd like to share? Of course. Uh, I think the key, have you ever heard of this theory about the 10,000 hours theory? Yes. So that theory works, like right? So well. when, I, when I first started out, I saw Damien Rice in concert, and I, 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 I mention it in a song. I said, I, don't, I won't stop till my name is in lights, Stadium Heights with Damien Rice. And literally, like, I watched him and was like, I want to do that one day. And wrote a million songs, did a million gigs, and have ended up kind of doing a similar thing. But it literally came from writing a song a day, or two songs a day, or five songs a day, and just getting all these songs out of me, doing a million gigs, sometimes three gigs a day. Sometimes we did six gigs a day one year at Glastonbury. But I think. Um, you view it as a dirty tap. When you switch a dirty tap on, it's going to flow shit water out for a substantial amount of time, and then clean water is going to start flowing. And now and then you'll get a bit of shit, but as long as it gets out of you, it's fine. <laughs> so with songs, you're going to write shit songs at the beginning. You are. My songs were terrible. My raps were terrible. Like I've listened to it the other day. It's awful. But I got it out of me. And the more and more you write, the more and more you experience, and then you start flowing clean water, and songs start getting better and better and better. And when you just you're on a good streak, you're writing good songs now and then you're going to write a shit song and that song is out of you and you can move on. And it's the same with gigs, like you will always play bad gigs at the beginning, that's what you need to do and then the more gigs you do the better you'll get now and then you'll have a shit gig but that's alright because you've got it out of you and you've experienced it. So I just say the more and more you can do, you put, put in your 10,000 hours, write as many songs as possible, gig as much as possible, always be nice to people because that is how the music industry works now. It doesn't work on who's the best. It, it, it works on who's got the best music and who's the nicest. That's why the people at the top of the chart, that's why Gary Barlow's been big for so many years because he's such a lovely bloke. Everyone wants to help him out. Oli Mers, fantastic. Every, he's really nice to everyone. That's why it works. Whereas you see certain singers who may not be nice to everyone and then they have a slow decline. I don't know. But yeah, I'd say be nice, write songs, do gigs. Wow, man, being nice. Who would have thought it, right? And I feel like I feel like that's the complete opposite perception of what most people actually think of the music industry. And I might just be talking about myself, but in my experience, when I go to talk with someone about the music industry, they say stuff like it's slimy and it's full of snakes. And I'm not talking about people actually working in the music industry. That's why I said it's what seems to be the common public perception of the music industry um or honestly even the entertainment industry in general like hollywood or whatever it just seems like people have always thought in these particular industries that you have to watch your back because somebody's likely to stab you in it and not only that i feel like it makes people think that they need to put up their guard and be cutthroat with people from the very jump but I mean, it makes sense that being nice and being likable is one of the best things that you can do for yourself, because the one thing that does hold true in the music industry is networking is key. And I don't know about y'all, but I wouldn't want to work with somebody that I don't even like to be around. And I don't necessarily have to personally like you, even though, you know, that never hurts. But it's a whole nother thing if I actually dislike you, like I don't have to like you. But I don't want to dislike you, you feel me? And we're artists, so I feel like a uh, part of our job is to have people naturally attracted to who we are and just our vibe in general. And I don't know, I guess that could depend on your brand, but I still personally feel like it's best to at least be somewhat likable as a person. And 
to be just an all around good and genuine person to be around. But again, I know that kind of depends on you and your brand, but being genuine and well-intentioned already aligns with me and my personality. So it was really a no-brainer to have that incorporated into my brand. But another thing that he was saying was that you need to put in your 10,000 hours. And I personally was never naturally gifted at creating music, to be real. Like, it's something that I wanted to do. And eventually, like he said, I was able to push through all of the bad music first. And I feel like a lot of people get that confused and they they let that stop them from pursuing anything with music because they listen to the Drakes or the Ed Sheerans of the world and they think, well, I don't sound like that. They must have some natural skill and I just wasn't born with that natural ability. But here's proof that that's completely untrue. I mean, Ed Sheeran just compared his first bit of music to the dirty water that first comes out of a dirty tap. But getting that clear water to flow is only going to be after you give it some time to run its course. I feel like so many people, they turn on a the faucet, they see the dirty water, and then they quickly turn it off because they embarrass that somebody might see that they don't have clean water yet. And they might even go back to turning on the faucet. You know, you have artists who stop making music and then they decide to pick it back up again somewhere down the line. But then they quickly turn that faucet right back off when they see that dirty water again. So if you only pursue the things that you're naturally able to do, you're going to be very limited in life. You feel me? If none of us push past the things that are initially hard for us, instead of walking, we'd all be crawling around on the ground because, I mean, if you've never seen a baby learning to walk, you can see it all over their face that it feels like the most unnatural thing in the world for them. But soon it starts to feel a lot more natural and walking turns to running, which turns to a full blown sprint. But the biggest takeaway I got from Ed Sheeran's advice is that you need to not only work the process, but you also need to trust it. Whether it's your first time or if you're just tired of paying for every song you release, then it might be time to consider using DistroKid. Not only can you release unlimited songs to all major streaming platforms like Spotify and Apple for only 40 bucks a year, they let us keep 100% of our royalties and they even have direct deposits to make it easier than ever to get paid what we deserve. By using my referral link, you'll be able to sign up and receive 7% off on your first year. In full transparency, I do receive commission off of this, but this isn't like an official sponsorship type of deal. This is actually my own personal referral link that DistroKid gives to the artists that use their services. So I put the link that saves you money down in the description for you, but let's go ahead and get back to the video. But let's go ahead and move on to our next clip. Here we got Kenyon Dixon dropping some gems on why artists should always believe in themselves. And it's probably not for the reason you'd expect. Most important thing, and, and we hear it a lot, uh, people are always saying, like, you know, believe in yourself. But the reason that's especially important is because I can tell you the number of times that I've went to a show and I don't believe what I'm looking at. So when you don't believe yourself, it's a, a lot harder to convince other people that they should believe in your vision. So it's important that you are your biggest fan and as long as you stay up on with your vision, I mean truly stay aligned with it. That's the tricky part about music, social media. We see so many different things. I know sometimes I have to stop myself. I, I could be scrolling and I see something and I'm like, I want to do that. I want to make a song like this. I want to make a song like that. It's like you got to remind yourself of what your actual vision is and you know what I'm saying, what you want to execute and add based on that consistency. And again, that execution, I think you'll always attract the right people to help you. Man, self-belief can be the most uplifting and crippling thing at the same time. And if I'm going to be real with you, this is something that I feel like I'm personally struggling with myself. And just like they say, real recognize real and game peeps game. I feel like it's just as easy to see when somebody's faking it. So this one definitely hit close to home for me. Um, not only do you need to be authentic, but it's also important to trust in your vision enough to confidently stand by it. And I'm somebody who occasionally deals with social anxiety. Um, a lot of times I just be going through the motions, but it's not just about nerves. I mean, even the most elite superstars say they get nervous before they perform. But I think he was talking more along the lines of regardless of whether or not you're nervous, you should be confident enough in what you're bringing to the table to where you could comfortably showcase it. 
But let's go ahead and wrap it up with our last clip of the day from Rapville. He's got a lot to say about how artists prioritize their budgets and get serious about their marketing. Can someone please tell me why rappers are still making the same mistake I was yelling about last year? Straight up, I just came off a meeting with one of the rappers that we're working with at the moment and oh my days. First things first, how are you spending $800 on a music video just to post about it twice? Twice! And then you're telling me that your only music marketing method is spamming all of your Snapchat friends. Bro! Firstly, there's a better way to spend your money. Everyone knows music videos are dying out for upcoming artists because nobody knows you yet. It's nice to add a storyline to your song when people know you, but at the moment, mm, 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 waste of money. Why don't you invest that $800 into short form content? Then you have like 60 days worth of content to blow up with. And I've seen bare rappers blow up on TikTok from literally just doing that. Second of all, your only strategy is saying, if you're a real one, go check out the song. Check me out. Share it out, my bro. Come on, man. Come on, bro. You can... Come on. You've spent $800 on the music video already. At least spend the same amount of money on social media ads. At least. And then go to a platform called Rapville and get it spinning on radio stations all around the world. The 800 artists who are already using Rapville understand what I mean when I say this platform is slick with it. For example, here was a campaign we went for a rapper recently and he got his song played on over 18 stations and this literally only took me 5 minutes of work to submit to all these stations. Now the way that Rapville is slick is that they guarantee that you get a response from these radio stations or else you get all your money back. So it just makes sense. It's way better than email, you don't get ignored ever again. But look, music artists, I'm not hating, I'm helping. First off, I want to say please, please, please don't be that artist that be spamming people with links to their music and, and people's DMs, man. I don't know one person who that type of promotion works on. That's like literally one of the quickest ways for someone to get their message request deleted by me. Like you sending me some unsolicited and lazy copy and paste message begging me to stream your song with like five fire emojis at the end. Why in the man, why in the world would I ever do that? Like what would you do if somebody sent you this same exact message? Like, bro, it kills me because artists like that are deleting similar messages that they get from other artists. But then for some reason, they think it's effective to turn around and do that same strategy for themselves. And I respect the hustle. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I've never been one of these artists, but it makes me cringe when I think about some of the ways that I used to try and market my music. And then spending $800 on a music video, and yeah, I've been there, I've done that too. But when is the last time that you were sold on an artist that you had never heard of based off of a music video? Just be real. When's the last time you saw a music video? It's just some random artist, you ain't never seen them before. And you're like, man, this music video is so good. And you became a fan for the rest of your life. I'm not saying that they don't have their purpose, but I feel like the role of a music video has shifted and that it's almost solely for your existing audience. So again, I'm not saying that they don't play a part in your career. I'm not saying you can't even use it, um, like clips of it, or even like push out ads to, to try and bring in an audience. But if you're still in the discovery phase of your music career, then every single dollar that you have should be stretched as far as it can. You feel me? An example, you could take that same $800, right? And you could get a videographer to shoot months of short form content for you. Even without ads, your short form content has the ability to be pushed out in front of people that would have never heard of you otherwise. And if you want to do a music video, then great. You know, go do a music video. I know all too well how that creative itch can feel. So if that's why you're doing this, then cool. But if your goal for creating a music video is to get all of these new eyes on you, and once they see this super amazing creative music video, they'll be fans forever. I'm sorry to break it to you, man, but more than likely, that's not going to be the case. So I feel like it's important for artists to ask themselves, before doing any project, not just music videos, it's important to ask, why am I doing this? What's the purpose of this? You know, why? what is the goal that I'm trying to reach by putting this out into the world? And then once you've actually recognized your goal, you'll be able to objectively assess if what you're doing will help get you to where you want to go. And I'm not saying that you can't do a music video. I'm saying try to shift 
the way that you look at what a music video is. It's no longer just one official, fully decked out music video. It's a whole bunch of many vertical music videos that can tell endless amounts of stories around your song. If anything, we're able to get even more creative than we ever were before because we're no longer limited to just one idea for a video. But regardless of what type of content that you're spending money to create, you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't at least have the same amount of money set aside for a marketing budget. And by having multiple short form pieces of content as opposed to one singular music video, you could put that on all the different platforms for free, I might add, and look at which ones perform the best. And then you could take those same videos and put a marketing budget behind it because they've already proven to work. And running ads is never some magic button that you press and you get millions of fans and streams overnight. There's always going to be a level of trial and error. And there's a lot of comparison and testing so that you can optimize your ads. But now with all this free organic reach that we all have access to, we have the opportunity to test out our different creatives, you know, whether it's a video or a picture or still image or whatever, but we're able to test out our different creators and see how people respond to it for 100% free. The more we take advantage of the free tools and resources that we have at our disposal, the better the outcomes will be once you throw some money on top of it as well. But I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up right there, man. That's going to do it for today's episode of Let's Talk About It. I drop a new episode every single week. So if you're not already, go ahead and subscribe to the channel so you can get notified for more videos like this. Let us know down in the comments what your favorite piece of advice was from this episode. And until next time, y'all keep pushing because we starting to gain some leverage. What, you still here? You must not know a video to watch next or something, huh? All right, man. I got you, bro, but you gonna have to get up out of my studio, cause yes, what they the? They got me showing up. You can keep your keep it. Find the gate if they won't let me in. Yeah. We balancing the scales now, and we got them scared. Yeah. We been gaining leverage. Mm. What I need a hand out for? Mm. Watch me really put myself on. And the leverage drop gems. You got all the free game, yeah.